vision from the eyes of Michael. We suspect other people don't need one. So welcome to this session on modeling dispersion. You can spread people, plants, animals, ideas, anything else spreading. I had an interesting conversation with somebody else tonight, this morning, who was, who was saying that we perhaps could usefully not just talk about spread, decline, and uh, withdrawal as well. And I think that's an interesting observation, and people have things to say about that, you should feel free. This is a slightly unusual session, one of the two sessions like this at the meeting, is a discussion session. So people out there, uh, I hope, feel, will feel they have a much right to speak to people on this side of the table. But to stimulate discussion, we've got three speakers other than myself. I'm not proposing to give a formal presentation because I think I said pretty much all I can usefully say this morning. But I've invited three other people who have rather different perspectives on issues of market spread. And I've asked them to talk to you a little bit about the kind of problems they're working on and the kinds of solutions they are developing. All of them are one or another developing solutions, not just using solutions. Um, they're all taking a very, very different approach. So I'm going to start by introducing Graham Sarson, who is using who's, who's using models that are closest perhaps to some of the models that those of you who have a classical training in archaeology would have seen as undergraduates, because he's got an interesting twist on his head, so he's going to tell you about that. Okay, thank you, David. Okay, so let me give the slides up first. Hold on a second. Okay, so I guess it's supposed to be very formal, so uh, if it's not clear what I'm saying, please do interrupt me and ask. Uh, and I'm only hoping to talk for 10 minutes or so, just the background of the type of modeling I mean. But if I end up going on longer than intended, please do just stop me. Okay, my name is Greg Sarsen, I'm from School of Maths and Stats at Newcastle, where uh, this group has been doing these sort of models for the last five years or so now. I can't mention everybody that's been involved or is just getting involved now, but core to the stuff we've done, which has made it to publication so far, has been uh, Anvar Shukrov and our permanent colleagues there, and uh, Kate Davison, the PhD student, uh, who's in our group. And I should also mention, not in the School of Maths and Stats, but uh, was in the School of Archaeology in Newcastle, was uh, Emeritus Professor Pavel Dolkanov, who got Anvar and I interested in, in this problem in the first case. It's the reason we got into this at all, and who sadly uh, died just before Christmas. So he'll be sadly missed by all of us. Okay, so to say a little bit about the sort of models we're talking about here, because uh, everybody does mean something slightly different by modelling in this context. Uh, I'm describing here as forward modelling. They're very much theoretical models, models that uh, just propose some rules for explaining the behaviour of a certain system and see how they evolve. And only afterwards will we compare those to the data. So we're forward in that the data isn't involved, as opposed to, say, an inverse model that tries to fit the model to the data. Uh, of course, ultimately, we hope to compare it to the data at the end of the day, uh, ideally with uh, data that you can sort of calibrate your model in one context and then compare predictions in a totally separate context to see how successful your model is. But the data is sort of secondary to the evolution of the original model in this approach we are taking here. And within this type of model, there's a whole uh, set of schemes of different type of models that can be uh, investigated. I've just tried to outline a few of the possible differences here, continuous versus uh, discrete, deterministic versus stochastic or random, local versus non-local or long-range mechanisms. The models I'm going to talk about here are in all cases going to be taking the first of these options, which in a sense is the mathematically simpler one. So I'm going to be talking about throughout today just continuous models. So rather than dealing with individual people moving as discrete entities, we just assume there's a background population density and see how that evolves uh, in time. And uh, rather than explicitly allowing for different random steps that these people might make, we assume that's all been averaged out uh, by the law of large numbers. We assume that enough of this random stuff is going on and on a long enough time scale it averages so that the outcome of our deterministic model would be the mean of a suite of random models which you might investigate. And uh, well, we've for simplicity just been allowing people to spread using local me mechanisms rather than the perhaps more realistic possibility, particularly of Neolithic and later developments, that people might move by large scale leaps uh, and not necessarily just spread 
from point to point in a continuous process. So all of these things are simple simplicities of our model, and yet I would still say that not enough is understood of these simple models before we start investigating the more complicated ones. So I'd say that what our approach has been to look at these simple models, uh, see what we can understand of the data with these. Uh, if these models are doing fine, then arguably the data is not good enough to let us try and resolve the more complicated models anyway. Okay, so the sort of uh, population dynamic models which I will be talking about have a long history uh, in archaeology, as Caitlin referred to. So all of you, I'm sure, will have seen slides like this pointing out uh, sort of the first application of these to the Neolithic uh, was from Ammerman and Cavallis and Forks in the early 70s. They pointed out that if you look at the dates, and hopefully you can just about make out some particular dates here of Neolithic sites throughout Europe. It can be fairly well modelled as the first population uh, by a spread from the New East going with more or less constant uh, velocity. So these uh, circular arcs are the spread from the Near East uh, reaching throughout Europe and for such a simple model with no spatial really, really resolution just spread in all directions equally, this actually does a surprisingly good job of fitting arrival times uh, in Europe in this way. So the first thing we did when we tried to get into this was just try and find these models. Ammerman and Thales also didn't try and incorporate any real uh, geography into this at all. So the first thing that we tried to do was investigate a model where we did real geography in Europe with coasts and mountains and latitude which might affect people's capacity to live and look at how this influenced the spread. And we did it, as I say, with one of these population dynamics models. There will only be a small number of equations in my intro, uh, so please, um, feel free to ignore them if they don't make sense to you, but I think it at least gives a flavour for the type of model we're doing here. What we're trying to do is look at the evolution in time of a quantity like capital M here. It's just local population density. This is a function of both space and time in this model. This equation, the classic model for uh, population dynamics spread, where there's a logistic time growth term and a diffusive time spread term, just lets you evolve this thing in time. So this equation just tells us that at every point the rate of change is equal to a term reflecting the logistic growth and a term reflecting the diffusive spread. And we just start from some initial condition, which is some population of the farmers in Jericho, and evolve this in time and see how this spread leads this uh, population to spread throughout Europe. And this is results, if you can read these uh, contours, probably a little too small. They're labelled with a uh, number of years in our model from uh, setting off of the wave in Jericho. So by 3,000 years in this model, if you reach this point, by 5,000 years, if you reach this point. And uh, by incorporating the real geography like this, we can do uh, a much more quantitatively better fit than the original models, which obviously lacked coasts and mountains and geographical barriers. But this is really a very simple model. This diffusive type spread, if you're familiar with it, really corresponds to just a random walk, a theoretical random walk of people where they're as likely to go in any direction as any other direction. If you look at that in a mathematical limit, it gives you a term like this, which just gives you the diffusive spread in this sort of model. But people are not really uh, as likely to go in any direction. In fact, People are smart, they'll look at the local environment, they'll particularly move in directions where things look conducive environmentally or just it's easier to move. And simple enhancements of this model in this direction are certainly possible. So if instead of a random, isotropic random walk, you allow an anisotropic random walk where people are more likely to move in one direction than another, you then get another sort of term here, mathematically it just looks like this, it's an effective sort of term. And in this model, we've tried to refine it by uh, adding anisotropic diffusion along the coastlines of major waterways. So we now have a term happens to be in this form here, which corresponds to the fact that people near the coast are more likely to move along the coast than inland. People near major waterways are more likely to move along the waterway in one direction or the other than against it. And then in the first attempt at this sort of modeling, we've just added the Danube and the Rhine and the main sources, and see how this effect uh, affects our model. And you can sort of see from the bending of this contour here, it's had an effect, obviously, of increasing the spread along these river valleys in a way which would produce the arrival time of the LB uh, K culture along the Danube uh, uh, much better than an isotropic uh, model does. And okay, all these things 
It's really just forward modeling, but at some point we want to compare the data. And so a couple of slides just to this. Uh, each of the circles on this plot here corresponds to a real uh, near fluid site, often involving more than one radiocarbon date, uh, but for some for from various mechanisms mechanisms for each site, we can get a mean date which we think corresponds to the first arrival. And uh, if we set off a model like this from Jericho here and compare the, the time R spread, which is that point, with the, the radiocarbon data point, we can look at the deviation and work out if our model is doing a good job or not. We actually did this for the data for Western Europe, which was what was available to us at the time. And uh, for this data, well, the white uh, circles correspond to the model arriving within 500 years of the data, which we correspond as a good fit whereas the, the red and blue ones uh, correspond to relatively poor fits. Uh, we found that Western Europe, from this model, sourced in Jericho is fitted quite well. But later on, we got some data from the Eastern European plane, and if you notice the data points here tend to be more colourful, there's many more poorly fitting points uh, in Eastern Europe. So that this is telling us that this simple model with a single uh, source in Jericho doesn't fit the arrival times of Neolithic culture in Eastern Europe, that's actually pottery bearing culture, not necessarily the science of uh, settled agriculture. Uh, but the single source model in Jericho doesn't fit it very well. So the sort of thing we can do with this model is investigate other mechanisms. So what we did here was investigate the effect of having another source uh, of Neolithic culture, the pottery culture, in uh, the Asian area and trying to fit the data throughout Europe with one source here and one source here. And you can sort of hopefully see from this compared to the last slide that the addition of the second wave allows the, the data in Eastern Europe to be fitted a lot better. Okay, just an example of one sort of thing we can do with this model. And if I can take a couple more minutes, uh, just briefly like to describe another type of model extending this, perhaps in a, a more interesting way in terms of uh, what many people would be interested in here is in how this culture is actually adopted and taken over, uh, and how it evolves as people take up certain uh, cultural novelties. Uh, so a slight variation of this model allows us to consider more than a single population. So here we're looking at a model which considers a population of farmers, people starting in uh, the New East, say, a population of hunter-gatherers, say, that fill the rest of Europe at that point. It also allows uh, for a population of converts, which are people that are originally of, of the hunting gathering uh, genetic stock, but who've been converted to farming. So each of these populations behaves essentially like the previous one, with a diffusive term and a logistic growth term. But we now have additional terms which allow for the conversion of hunter gatherers to converts. And these people are sort of being taken out of the hunting gathering pool and put into the convert pool. And if we have now these three coupled equations and allow them to uh, evolve in parallel, well, you can get various different types of behaviour. One of the nice things about this type of model is that you can analyse it analytically and get exact results. And you can find that for this system, uh, for various sets of parameter values, which here are given by these cryptic uh, possibilities here, but basically correspond to whether or not the converts can successfully outcompete the natural hunters and or uh, the natural farmers, you can see that you can have different types of waves that are possible. So that in one region, <coughs> the farmers just can't compete and everything is just hunter-gatherers or converts, which are genetically identical, remember. But you get other types of waves which are possible in other different parts of the rapture space. So you get one like this, for example, where you get travelling from your source uh, throughout your model you get just a little uh, advanced guard of farmers spreading this culture with them, but they're just moving as a small population. Behind them, the hunters have all converted, and you're, they're leaving a convert population behind them. But the farmer population itself just passes through and doesn't leave any real genetic trace there. You get another sort of model here, where the farmers and the converts quickly reach an equilibrium and move in parallel. The hunters are pushed back and effectively like Titus hunter gatherers in this model, but behind the wave of advance, you get sort of a, a constant profile of farmers uh, to converts, which again isn't particularly interesting for genetic reasons. But of interest, perhaps, is the fact that this model at the top 
is the one which is perhaps more realistic for most estimates of the actual parameters of the Neolithic. And the type model, type of wave, this uh, suggests, it suggests that the farmers start off spreading the culture from the new east or whatever, but after a certain point, the converts have sort of converted in significant numbers such that from that point onwards, they take over the propagation so that the farmers have started to spread, but from this point onwards, the spread of the novelty of the farming culture is being carried by the converts rather than by the, uh, the, far, the original farmers themselves. The net effect of this, once the wave is passed, is that you've got this region with farmers to the left, converts to the right, and uh, as time evolves, these two populations will diffuse into each other so that you'll get throughout this regime a sort of gradient of the genetics so that people at one end of the regime will be uh, essentially all uh, the farming stock, the other end will be the original uh, Mesolithic hunting gathering stock. But you'll be able in the meantime to get in between this gradient of uh, genetic material which will let you try and fit this thing uh, to the data. And this sort of model, I'll put up one uh, last final slide, uh, can be used to Europe, and here we try to model it to India, where we're spreading farming culture into the Indian subcontinent from uh, off the uh, Middle East and from uh, Southeast Asia. And you're finding that this sort of wave is realised here. So the original farmers start to spread here and here, but after 2,000 years, or the top two slides are after 2,000 years, the farmers population density high, this yellow here, has been superseded by the converts in this region here. It's the converts that are uh, leading the spread of the farming culture down to the tip of the Indian South Coast. And after 5,000 years, which is the bottom plot, farmers uh, convert uh, density. Again, you get this gradient. So the converts are highest in the south, the farmers are highest in their original source regions. And in between, you'll get some uh, genetic gradient, which is observed, from what I understand, from the, the people working with the genetics of the Indian subcontinent. Okay, that's... Thank uh, you very much, Eddie. Does anybody have any questions of clarity? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, concerning your population model, you said that you are using this um, diffusion um, coefficients. Yeah. Um, how are you calibrating this uh, diffusion? Uh, it's a very difficult thing to estimate. Um, they can be estimated in some ways. You, you can do back of the envelope type calculations in terms of how far people can spread, how far you think a farm might, uh, a farming community might sustain efficient use of new virgin soil before it's worth as well to move on and, so, uh, and continue to move in this way. But the parameters behind this sort of parameterization are not very clear, so it's quite difficult to do. So. Uh, to be honest, what we've done is what most other people, and obviously we're not the only people working on this, have done in literature, is in some regions uh, just take it to be a value which explains the rate of spread of the car in some regions. And so this is sort of the reason why one point is made at the start is so important. Ideally, you want uh, your model to be tested over that whole second region such that you've obviously calibrated your model for the spread in Europe. You want the same model to also explain the spread in North America, so otherwise the risk is you've just tweaked the model to one particular data set because this difficulty is particularly hard to handle. Anybody else? Yes, please. Um, I think it's your turn. So, quickly. while you set up, I'll just explain what's happening. Those of you who looked at the participant list would have seen James Steele listed as our. GIS expert, but he very excitedly emailed me last week to say they can't be here because he's buying a house. So that was a fairly good excuse. Very kindly, of Michael has agreed to step in. And tell us about his GIS perspectives.
Ja, so my name is uh, Michael Merker. I'm uh, working in the Rocky project, uh, the world of culture and the expansion of humans. Um, and this project is financed by the Heidelberg Academy of Sciences. And we are quite an interdisciplinary team. Uh, so, uh, apart from myself, uh, there is uh, Christine Hertha, she is a paleontologist, uh, Angela Buch, uh, she is a paleoclimatologist. We have uh, Andrew Kandel and Michael Gross, both archaeologists. And we have uh, Sarah Kamaiwa, uh, she is a computer scientist. Um, so, just let me give you some ideas of, um, let's say, our um, perspective of expansion uh, in our project with these uh, specific um, research questions. So, what is the role of culture in early expansion uh, of humans? So, um, if you think about uh, spatial expansions, um, uh, what we would like to do in our project is to identify the events of uh, expansion and retreat uh, from Africa or Asia uh, uh, to describe the habitats um, of the early hominin species, uh, artifact categories and so on. Uh, and we would like to describe these expansion uh, dynamics uh, from to and within Africa and uh, Eurasia. Um, and we would like to do it in quite narrow uh, chronological um, units. So, um, to talk about expansions, um, uh, in our team there are uh, different perspectives of uh, expansion. So, um, we have, um, let's say, the perspective of the uh, uh, geo-science uh, people, so spatial expansion. So, if we are talking about expansion, we normally mean spatial expansion, and uh, this could be expansions of habitats, uh, of uh, organisms, or as well as uh, of artifacts. Um, but we have also the, let's say, uh, behavioral uh, component of uh, expansion, and I will give uh, later on in some uh, examples. So, uh, in this case, biological, cognitive, cultural, or functional uh, expansion. So, the uh, question is how to model um, these uh, more cultural uh, um, issues. Um, Concerning habitat uh, expansions, um, uh, we have, uh, um, let's say, different um, approaches. Um, so for reconstruction of vegetation, uh, we have mainly two approaches. So uh, the nearest living relative approach or uh, physiognomic uh, approaches, and that is valid for both for uh, vegetation cover as well as for um, climate or quantification. Um, I have to admit that the project has just started two years ago. This, these are our let's say, strate strategic ideas on how to model these different uh, issues of um, uh, hominin expansions. Um, other possibility is um, to describe um, habitat um, expansions or habitat characteristics by uh, eco profiling. So, um, using information about body mass, diet, and locomotion, you can derive from uh, fossils um, in order to um, establish um, the uh, composition of the fauna uh, or of the habitat. Um, so, here we have two uh, different uh, examples uh, one from uh, Genel and the other from uh, Ketung uh, Burgos um, in Indonesia. Um, so Using these uh, parameters, we are able to derive information about the composition of the uh, habitats. So then uh, there are also uh, biological uh, expansions, uh, starting with uh, genes. So um, uh, what is the gene expression rate? Uh, what is the life history uh, uh, related to, uh, to the early hominins? What have been their locomotion, uh, nutrition? Uh, the brain differentiation and um, the perceptual apparatus and uh, then also the communicative um, capacity. So, uh, uh, starting with genes and then uh, coming to culture, because uh, the last point, cognitive capacity, is a cultural, um, cultural issue. So, uh, for example, how to measure, how to model um, cognitive um, uh, cognitive um, Possibilities of the early humans. Um, we have uh, an individual and we have a target. So uh, the individual is going to um, tackle a certain target. Um, if uh, the uh, cognitive um, um, potential is growing, 
Um, this target can be reached by using tools, so uh, in an easier way. However, on the other side, um, the problem solution distances are increasing uh, using tools. And uh, you can put it into such type of uh, cognigrams, and uh, the uh, higher the problem solution distances are, the higher the cultural uh, background of the people uh, are. So this is an example for how to model uh, cognitive um, expansions. So then we have uh, the, let's say, uh, geoscience uh, uh, approaches, so the GIS uh, analysis and modeling, um, question all the models of dispersal uh, routes, and um, there we mainly have two different types of uh, approaches. Uh, more actor-based modeling, so where you have to know um, if the individual has been in a certain location, or what is the, um, uh, let's say, um, what is the, uh, the rules uh, these individuals are following. So we have, uh, for example, the st stochastic uh, habitat models uh, based on presence absence data uh, and on uh, environmental uh, variables. Uh, we have machine-based learning approaches. Uh, also over here, we have uh, target variables, so uh, presence uh, data, for example, for dominant uh, presence and also environmental variables and we have um, such a cellular automata where we have roots that are um, uh, driving the expansion of um, the early human. On the other hand, we can also describe the habitats in order to uh, give an idea of what might be the potential ways uh, the early hominins uh, might have followed. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, what are suitable areas they they have um, followed on, on during their um, dispersion. And therefore, um, we have also seen today uh, analysis with um, coast pass um, uh, analysis, uh, barrier corridor, or stepping stone analysis, uh, so landscape metrics uh, to uh, derive information. So, two different types of models an actual based modeling and more uh, model models that are um, describing functional environmental relationships. Yeah, here are some examples I've uh, shown before uh, in the uh, session, uh, remote sensing uh, session, um, where we did some modeling of um, five locations uh, in Tanzania. Um, here we have some uh, red dots, and these are uh, presence data, so where we have found something and uh, we did the modeling uh, using environmental variables, um, so topographic variables as well as um, remote sensing information. And uh, then uh, the uh, model for probabilities of paleontological sites or occurrence probabilities. And you see blue high probabilities and in uh, yellow uh, low probabilities. So this is also a type of model in order to um, describe um, the uh, uh, expansion of uh, uh, the units. So then classical uh, model uh, to reconstruct um, paleo-violent from uh, geomorphology. Um, so just as an example, where we um, uh, analyze the paleomorphology, so in this case, for example, the paleomorphology of Tanzania, um, with uh, different uh, um, paleo habitats, uh, so uh, for example, paleo data or shorelines that can be detected using um, digital information models as well as the spectral information. Moments, that's it. Um, so uh, you see, we have a lot of um, different, a um, lot of different models that we um, have to apply in order to get the whole range of um, aspects that are tackled by um, this research question. So, what is the role of culture for the expansion? Thank you. So, okay, any questions of? of Clarity or facts before <coughs> final presentation for this. Ideas that uh, 
he's not working on data that has very close similarity to the data I was talking about this morning. Um, indeed, he's talking about using modern data to help us to learn about past human dispersal. And I'll leave it. Okay, yes, so again, so I'm, a, I'm a statistician, um, but I don't work on um, archaeological data. I work on modern DNA sequence variation data. So there are, as she said, a lot of methodological uh, things that we do the same, but there are important differences because of the data that we're treating. And in some ways, that makes some of what I do more difficult, and in some, some ways it makes it more easy. The problem with archaeological data is that the culture and the demic, or the migration, the demic diffusion, whatever you want to call it, are all bound up in the, in the data in some way together, and trying to tease them apart is difficult. If you look at the genes, though, apart from perhaps a rather small number of the genes in, in the human genome, most of what genetic variation is telling you about is, is nothing to do with culture. It's just to do with, well, maybe to do with natural selection, but largely what it's to do with is, is the way the, the, the modern dispersal of genes is telling you essentially where people have been in the past, how they migrated in the past, and what population sizes have they been in the past. So it's a way of teasing apart the cultural aspects of the, of the uh, signal that you see in the data from the, from the uh, demographic or, or migration patterns. So, just to put a bit more flesh on that, genet um, as people disperse, they take their genomes with them, so the genomes disperse. So if we can look at patterns in the, of the genetic material, we may learn something about where it is dispersed. So that genet the difficulty, though, is that the genetic material that one has available is genetic material that's around now. It's the genetic material that's in you and me. So the data that we collect are DNA sequences from modern populations. Whereas the archaeologist at least is collecting things, artifacts, that were around at the time of the processes, processes that we're trying to explain what were going on. Okay. The genetic material is, is here now. I'll come back to that um, slight, slight uh, exception to that at the bottom of the slide, which is just um, So the archaeology has, uh, the archaeology has artifacts in the past that can be reasonably well dated. The genetics doesn't, it has samples in the present, and we to infer what's going on in the past. So, okay, from my other statistician, so basically what we're doing all the time is modeling uncertainty. The way we differ is in the sorts of uncertainty that we're trying to model. Well, the sign about ancient DNA is, of course, there is, uh, you can collect uh, bone material and, in, in favorable circumstances, extract DNA from that bone material and maybe sequence it. That's a difficult procedure and it's fraught with a particular difficulty when we're just focused on modern humans because can contamination from, from what, what humans present now on the bone can be very difficult to distinguish from the DNA that's actually in the bone, so you can never really be all that sure of what you're recovering is, is uh, ancient material. Even if you could be sure, it's, a, it's technically difficult, so you're never going to have large sample sizes of DNA sequences from the past. You may have one small, so you have a small number that you can rely on, and they may be useful to test inferences that come from modern DNA, but you don't work on them in, in ever up there in large quantities. So I don't think the situation in, in genetics is ever going to mirror the situation in archaeology where you've got. Uh, Things collected that were from the time of the processes we go on. 
So what is the uncertainty that I'm trying to describe? Well, there's various parts to it. The key, well, I suppose the key um, part of the uncertainty and where a lot of the mathematical interest in, in the models that I describe have a choice is in modeling genetic drift. So genetic drift is just basically how the genetic variation that was present at the time that the processes were going on has been disrupted through time uh, uh, as reflected in the data we collect. So just as uh, just a random process to deal with basically with who has children and who doesn't, those people that have children pass on the, the genetic material, those people that don't don't pass on the genetic material. And that random process of who happens to have children ramified down uh, hundreds and uh, thousands of generations causes variation in gene frequencies that we see in the present day. And we've got to, in order to understand the past, we have to, uh, we have to model that process of the changes of gene frequencies. And that's, that's genetic. So there's lots of nice mathematical modeling that goes on. Because we're collecting data in the present, uh, we've got to have some kind of clock, some way of turning the variation that we see into time. We want, to, we want something like a radiocarbon uh, clock in order to say that this signal that I detected was going on 10,000 years ago or 6,000 years ago. And fortunately, uh, there is, at least to some, ex to some approximation, a clock of that type. It's called a molecular clock. It's basically the idea that mutations, changes in DNA sequence happen, happen in a random way, but they happen at some rate. And if we, if we work out what that rate is, we can turn measurements of genetic variation into time estimates in the past. So there's more mathematical modeling go, goes on in describing um, the... Now, um, the... Because the thing that we try to pull out of this variation is something about demography. So one has to understand the, work, the way in which demography, migration rates, population sizes in the past affect variation in the present. And if you have different types <coughs> of demography, the effects will be different. So if you believe that uh, human prehistory is all about just small scale diffusions of people, then maybe that makes some prediction about what the data that you see now genetic data that you see now should be, and you can test whether that fits your data or not, or maybe you believe in the, most of uh, the signal that we see goes from large, large scale, long scale migration, <coughs> or models of that type, and, and ask the data to, to, to choose between these, or something <coughs> to model in between. So this, this, the, the, the principal modeling goes in in choosing a, a class of de demographic models, and try to fit your data to it. Um, another aspect which I'm less involved in it, but uh, other, other people spend a lot of time thinking about is what's the effect of natural selection? How have <coughs> genes that affect fitness, the, the ability of some proteins to do its job, how, how have those effects affected the gene frequencies that, that, uh, that we see? So some of this is to do with forward modeling. Given uh, what happened in the past, what would you expect to see now? Because I'm a statistician, I'm basically interested in backwards modeling, which is going to the data and trying to infer something about the present. So, what, what Kate, similar to what Kate was saying this morning, she formulated a forward in time model to describe what pattern you'd see in the gradient of carbon dates if a particular model, a particular story around dispersal was true. And then the, the issue is how to fit that model to the gradient of carbon data, well, I'm doing the same thing here, except just the data type is different and the data type is different. The techniques by which, which we do that backwards modeling, that fitting of data to, to, to a model is very similar between us. We, we take a crazy <coughs> approach and use uh, markers chain type techniques to fit. So I, I emphasize the uncertainty just so that so uncertainty sounds like a bad thing, um, because it is in a sense almost what gives statisticians a, a job to do. Um, just to convince you that there is actually a signal in the genes, uh, this is a, a very nice study that was done a couple of years ago from 
genetic variation across, genetic variation across the whole genome in humans from Europe. Uh, this is a, just presents a, a simple multivariate principal components analysis of that of that data. Uh, so every every pair of legs on this diagram is an individual whose genetic material has been genotyped, has been uh, <coughs> measured, and um, it's been analysed by principal components analysis to try and pick out the strongest signal, the strongest signal in the variation of that data. And the remarkable thing is if you just look at the two the two principal two two uh, axes that explain the most of the variation. Plot, so plot a black plot, that thing there, compared to map of Europe, you see there's a, well, look at this, perhaps read all these letters, so these are all the Iberian samples, these are the Italian samples, these, the Eastern European uh, Slavic speaking samples, the UK samples up here. What you'll notice is there's an extraordinary correlation between that, which is purely genetic data, and this familiar map of Europe. So there's no geography going in to here, all of that's come out of the genes. There is an extremely strong geographical pattern in the genetic data, which must be telling us something about the process that led to the colonization of Europe. Obviously, the colonization of Europe is a complicated thing, and how you, uh, how you go about trying to simplify that history is something you can do statistical analysis with in, is, is a difficult task, but you have to make pretty really drastic assumptions. So one of the um, one of the things, one of the main ideas that goes behind the work that I try to do is how is a, a, a simple pattern of migration reflected in the data? Just think about the relationships between individuals in the sample, they will be collected by some kind of tree. The, just think here of um, eight individuals in this audience, we're all connected at some, any position in the genome by a, by a tree, maybe that's the tree, we don't know what that tree is, that tree will go back hundreds, tens or hundreds of thousands of years, there's no way we can know it exactly. But, Demographic processes have an effect on that tree. So imagine a simple, simple set, settlement process where you have a source population sending off migrants into a descendant population. Maybe this is the tree of individuals in the source population. Think about a settled region. Suppose there was a single settlement at this time. Well, some of these individuals in that tree at that time will be transported over here into, maybe that's the Near East and this is Europe, will be transported into Europe. And within Europe, after that time, um, they, they will have descendants reflected by these green lines in this tree. So what you'll see in the data are a number of closely related clusters of, of DNA sequences, closely related DNA sequences. Just in case you don't see a DNA sequence, there, that's the sort of data I'm dealing with. Uh, that's a sample of Kurtz, um, sequenced with mitochondrial DNA. Um, it's not perhaps not obvious that there's any variation there. There is, if you strip away all of the uh, commonalities, you'll see, for example, this position, position of the DNA sequence, this person has a C, but all of the rest of the T. So there's variation there to deal with. And finally, clusters in that, in that data will be evidence of relatedness. So um, the kind of analysis that I do tries to pick up closely related clusters in the settled region, Europe, in, in green. And by looking at the amount of genetic variation within those clusters and using the molecular clock to infer something about when those clusters arrive in Europe. Um, this is a summary of a, a study we did a, a few years ago, which was actually preserved in the settlement in Europe. So each of the lines of this figure is one of these clusters that we think was brought into Europe <coughs> during a settlement at some time. So this is the present here, the past 50,000 years ago. So for example, this cluster 
close to here, which represents about 2% of modern Europeans, seems to have arrived in uh, Europe some, sometime around between uh, about 30 and 40,000 years ago. Uh, and they're sorted by age, and this one arrived, it's not clustered down here, so only 1% of the modern sample arrived uh, sometime in the last 10,000 years. So that's the way that so we can take inferences of this kind and then try to explain what migration processes could have given rise to patterns of that kind. Uh, I think we'll probably I'll stop there and uh, answer any questions of clarification for the others. Any questions of clarification? I appreciate that there will be some people in the audience who never really thought about genetic data, especially modern genetic data before, so please feel free to ask. As I say to my students, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Any question will help clarify things for everybody. So. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much to everybody for making the time and the special slides for these presentations. So we have I've lost track of time myself. But we have we have 40 minutes, if we wanted, slightly less if we want less time, to for an open discussion now of issues in the modeling of spread and dispersal of people and ideas and genes. Um, and I propose that we that, that the four of us will start the discussion, but please just show show, show your hand or standing up if you'd like to take part, or just chipping in if you'd like to take part. And the first thing I would like to discuss is for those people who are actually building models themselves, is this plethora of models that we're between us developing helping or hindering? <laughs> so, are we at the stage where there are so many models? So many different things called models that it's very hard for people on any um, large archaeological project to even know where to go for help. So you are working on a very big team. If you heard that there was a new team of archaeologists sitting up somewhere in Norway and they needed to look around for modeling tools. Dispersal problems. Where would you tell them to start? Hmm. Question. Um, I think um, um, if you have um, a research question which is uh, tackling different disciplines, um, um, you have to um, define first um, which kind of, of uh, let's say, specific. Um, questions uh, will be asked uh, from the different perspectives and from the different disciplines. And, uh, I think once <coughs> this process has been uh, defined, so what kind of um, information we want to get out uh, in order to answer our research questions, then it's also I think, quite easy to uh, pick the right notes for the right uh, questions. <coughs> so, for example, in our project uh, we have um, the cultural aspects uh, we cannot answer, uh, for example, the this um, uh, um, uh, GIS models. Okay? So therefore we need another type of, of model, um, uh, and therefore we need also specialists uh, who are um, dealing uh, with this specific um, uh, model. So uh, it's not that uh, uh, one archaeologist or one geographer can tackle all the different uh, uh, all the different aspects. So we need some specialists for the specific. Okay, I think that picks up on something I said this morning, which is that I don't see a way to sensibly understand spread unless we say precisely what it is for spreading. So, I mean, for a long, long time, archaeologists have talked in very general terms about the arrival of the Neolithic, as if that is something, a single thing that arrived. And I think increasingly we, we don't believe that anymore. And I think one of the things that I would say. To anybody starting out on a new project, a large scale project, trying to understand landscapes or collections of sites, is don't try to do it all at once. 
identify the things that are most important to you and then talk to the people with those expertise. So if you really want to understand the spread of the genetic makeup of your community, the community you're interested in, you might very well not want archaeological data at all. You might want modern data and models that go with them. That would be my advice. Um, but then there comes the question, and I guess this is more for perhaps for the mathematicians and statisticians, when should you use deterministic models? When should you use classic ones? I have a few is that you should certainly stop using the term list of ones for 10 percent and you're no longer doing a good job. I mean, certainly you can envisage cases for stochastic models which allow for extreme events in a different way will produce some outcome which will never come out of the term list of model. And if that's clearly the case from your data or from your uh, trial model, then you have to go to the stochastic model. Uh, but if a certain Terminix model is doing a reasonable fit to the data, which in many cases is not very uh, precise, then it's hard to justify uh, purely from the point of view of modeling the data all the additional expense of a typically more complicated stochastic model approach. So, do you think that there's a, there's a geographic scale below which it's not sensible to try to go in general terms, in spatial scale? Uh, Would the terms model for that reason? Certainly, I, I mean, I haven't tried to do a small scale model myself, but I wouldn't really expect the terms to model to work on many scales of the technology, so where it might work okay on many scales of thousand kilometers. Uh, but if it is working on many scales of thousand kilometers, I'd say want to ask very clearly what the benefits of uh, another type of model would be, because I think there's a strong risk, particularly amongst mathematicians. We like making up models for the sake of making up models and just writing papers with a new model that you uh, come up with a new idea, uh, try and find some data which doesn't contradict it, and put yet another model in the literature which uh, does lead to just a profusion of different effects. Yeah. And I don't think, well, I'm not an expert in archaeological applications at all, really, but from reading the literature, it seems to me there's a lot of models out there and not being a consensus towards which ones are the future, which ones are doing better jobs. Um, if, if that can arise in the near future, hopefully rather than the long future, so much the better. But perhaps more work has to be done with people just trying these uh, models as it suits them and sort of uh, Stochastic minimization problem, simulated and kneeling type problem, yes. and get to the solution. It may be that in all this pottering uh, around, suddenly somebody comes up with a model which is substantially better than the others, in which case it must have been a foolish approach to take. It's not clear to me that that would be the outcome. Uh, it seems to be one of the risk is that the models are driven ahead of the reliable data. Well, it's only really from my own perspective, which is viewing genetic data. Um, it's, it's less clear to me in the archaeological context, but it, there is so much randomness in the processes that generate the sequences that you see in the present day. I just don't see how you can, can let those, those temporary <coughs> Uncertainties and parameters, you, you just have to describe. There's no, just, there is, as far as I'm aware, no determinative way of doing that. And it's true, isn't it? That nobody's, there is nobody seeking to build deterministic models for the setting that you're working in. Um, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. So I think for those of you who haven't done very much mathematical or statistical modeling for yourselves, one of the very simple ways to think about this is that. If the problem that you're trying to understand has inherently uncertain or random things happening as part of the development, for example, people randomly having children, pairs of people coming together randomly, then it's relatively difficult to do a good job of the deterministic model on that. Unless there's a way to zoom out, as as Graham has suggested, to a scale beyond which the randomness ceases to be so important. And in some spatial stuff, we can do that. But I think it's probably true with genetics. I mean, in some sense, Kavali's. Uh, there, is a, there is 
There is a relationship to deterministic models because Galal is forced to try to, to verify these when the advanced by the energy frequency data. Um, but it's still controversial with the extent to which there's a strong correlation between if you look at blood groups and protein polymorphisms, really old fashioned genetics, um, and just look at the strongest signal that you see, there is an extremely strong correlation with the geographical pattern and the, uh, the patterns that you were describing of uh, the wave of advance that you see in uh, the archaeological record. Um, it's a strong correlation, but you don't know that that's actually because it's been caused by the same process. Um, for example, you don't know that the genetic gradient that you see was generated by the Neolithic, it might have been generated by your first settlement of Europe. Um, and you can't answer that question unless you develop a model um, of how gene frequencies change. And you can't do that unless you build in for stochastic, unless you model stochastic. Yeah. So, uh, so I think what you, what you can see is, is, is development of an argument that says that Vincent doesn't believe the model doesn't have stochastic component. And this is why we get to the stage where there's three people with different models. But before, before, I mean, Adam and Adam this model didn't have access to the genetic data that you have access to. So, no, it's still, it's still, it's like team so, yeah. Okay, so then alongside all of this, there are GIS experts building all sorts of things that they also call models, and which will go for this. Those of us with the maths training often find it very difficult to see what the model actually is. So, the word model is used, pictures are shown. It's not clear what the underlying engine is that's taking the data and turning it into those pictures. So I'm hoping that Michael might tell us a little bit more about what kind of what kind of algorithm, what kind of theoretical motivation there is underlying. So, I mean, I'm not pressing you for anything very technical here, for a really quite simple description in a modelling sense of what's going on. Can you do that? Um, let's say from my perspective, I'm coming from the soil science of um, the models um, that we use um, to uh, predict um, uh, occurrences, for example, uh, or soil types or certain geomorphological features. Um, so um, the development of the area is going to um, do data fusion, so to uh, uh, combine different uh, data sources, so especially also um, different um, spatial scales in order to detect certain processes and certain features uh, in, in your data. And um, therefore, I think um, the, um, the way uh, in the last couple of years uh, in this area is um, going to um, data mining technologies uh, or to, to get out um, information that is somewhere hidden in, in the data. Um, and as I um, presented in the afternoon, um, this is a methodology where we have some uh, information of, of a specific uh, feature, um, and you have different um, explanative um, variables, um, which are in a combination explaining um, the occurrence of, uh, for example, uh, paleontological sites. You know? um, and um, I think only with these combinations of uh, different types of data um, you get a lot of additional information um, that previously was not available. So coming along with the techniques um, that are uh, more and more introduced uh, in, in this area, um, you get also more information uh, and better information uh, about the specific features in your own landscape. So a completely different aspect uh, than uh, art from, from this is called uh, spatial modeling, um, this is um, then uh, the cultural uh, modeling we are trying to do in our project. So it's a completely different um, uh, approach, um, uh, completely different models that are used um, in this perspective. So, um, uh, and it's also quite difficult um, to, to get a combination, so to integrate, um, let's say, cultural aspects with um, spatial um, geoscience uh, aspects. Um, so that's the that's challenge in the future um, to, to get some fusion of uh, different models and what to um, generate, um, uh, let's say, additional or um, more specific information. So, how 
important is fusion. Some information is very informative. 
and some of us protest, and we're not always, it's not always easy to tell, I think, where the strength of information are. So. Good. Can I ask, I'm afraid of Mr. Cook's afternoon, but could I ask about these spatial GIS based models? How predictive are we? How, I can understand that in a, in a single study, they can do a good job of explaining some stuff. How, how general have the results from one study been in terms of also explaining? Which is also um, depending on your on your on the um target state that you are using. So if, if you are using data that are characterizing, let's say, uh, uh, a broader uh, landscape, um, then the model is also normally able to uh, explain more generally the landscape. If you're focusing on a specific topic, then for sure you have to calibrate it for uh, the certain situation you are going to model. So. Um, the question is, uh, what are you using this for? So, are you going to do some um, uh, modeling in order to uh, understand the general driving uh, process in your landscape, or are you doing some specific um, uh, modeling on, let's say, distribution of uh, soil types, for example? So, let's say different things um, uh, you can do with the scenario. And so, also the information you get out is different, more generic or more specific. So as somebody who by nature is probably looking for a more generic yeah. sort of force. Yeah. Do, I mean, do you think there's things that have come out of your recent data study that are definitely pleased about the spread of sort of um, so in this study I presented this afternoon, we are focusing locally uh, on uh, a certain region um, where we would like to know uh, how the spatial distribution of these uh, plant locations. And uh, I think we can do a proper job in this area um, to predict these sites. So um, I think that's uh, awesome. However, um, the question is, so uh, is it working also in uh, Ethiopia or uh, somewhere else? Uh, but I mean, if you do uh, similar studies that you there, um, you will find out what, uh, let's say, the driving factors of your, um, your uh, dynamics are. So, Try to um, develop uh, some generic um, um, uh, information out of these models if you stick to, uh, to a certain location or to a certain feature. So if you compare them with, with other, um, let's say, um, studies and some of that. They're awfully quiet, this students, aren't they? It's my first year teaching first years. Does anybody have any contribution they'd like to make to the discussion? I was just wondering because, well, I know that you work with another kind of like larger scale of human movement. I'm working more in a small scale of movement. And I was wondering how, um, if you consider some of the social variables, for instance, that you, or how you can consider social variables that actually have a great impact when you move, like, things like ideas that you have regarding certain spaces or territoriality or um, even things like um, yeah, terrestrial navigation like landscape markers and these kind of things if you actually have thought or you know these kind of things and how to model them yeah, well, since we are since we are looking at a, at a quite wide temporal range, which is also starting in three million years uh, before present until twenty thousand, so we are actually looking at at the humans or the early hominins as as animals more or less. So what what we are looking for is more or less the borders of the habitats, or the the borders of the the potential habitats, how they have changed during the during the different ages, and uh, this is more or less. The most important issue for for the dispersion or the expansions of that. Of yeah, the that's early what I was telling. Like, yeah, it's a different yeah time and it's a different scale. But I was thinking maybe you have thought something about these kind of issues or not. Well, yes. Yeah. Just to add, uh, in, in our project, uh, so as Walker said, uh, we um, tackle the as, as animals, so uh, mainly depending on, on, the, uh, on the habitat, on, on the environment around. 
but uh, uh, the younger um, the ages are becoming, uh, the more important um, cultural aspects are, so language uh, and, and so on. Uh, you are completely right. Um, but I think um, then we have to shift to another type of models in order to incorporate this information. And this could be, uh, for example, these ancient based models where you uh, have, uh, let's say, some rules incorporated and also. Uh, in some way, I don't know how yet, but in some way also um, behavioral um, components, so cultural and behavioral components. So I think the way to, to model it should go into the direction of agent based models because they are rule based. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of the things about most of the models we're talking about is you can in principle do what if experiments. Right? So you can, you can encode in your model some property that you personally believe is plausible that the rest of us haven't even thought of. You can encode it and compare that the model with that feature with the model without that feature and see and see which model fits better with the data if, you, if, you're, if you're doing it. So, or which model seems to uh, explain most of the variability if you're using more stochastic models. So there are always fit, but the onus is on, if you like, the users, and that in your case sounds like you, to talk to the mathematicians, the statisticians, and the GIS models and ask them to, to put those components in. Because it's not really, for many, I, mean, I do have an archaeological training, but many, many of the people building these models don't. And so they're the least qualified people to put in the details. The sort that you think, sounds like you think are important. Um, however, of course, in order to get that work published, you will, you personally, <laughs> will have to explain why that component needs to be in the model. Because it's almost certain that not everybody in this room even will agree with you about what component should be there. And that's the difficulty. Which components do we put in? Which components do we leave out? Or which one will eventually become accepted by the wider community? Maybe attach to this question and uh, maybe, maybe this is not fair one. Do you have any idea uh, how complex a model should be? Is there uh, some way of measure, measurement uh, uh, when the complexity is too, much, too complex uh, to uh, be simple enough to be plausible? Okay, well, I think you might get a different answer from the deterministic model. What do you do from the stochastic models? I don't know. Uh, well, I guess a lot of us would have a similar feeling that uh, if, if the model is so complex, the effect of varying parameters in the model just can't be tested, then it's too complex. I mean, it's quite easy to either a deterministic or uh, a stochastic continuous or agent based sort of model. It's very easy to come up with rules. And obviously, I've talked to the very simplest type of deterministic continuous models here. Quite complex rules for long range behaviour can be fed into these models too. It tends to lead to integral differential equations rather than differential equations. But you can propose them, you can try and uh, run them and for various parameters. Uh, but then you have to decide how are you going to test if your model is an improvement on the previous model. Right? Unless in advance you've got some clear idea of what would constitute an improvement of this model, whether it's in terms of uh, more. Uh, uncertainty led measures of fit or more direct ones for a simpler model. Uh, generally, generally speaking, it's very easy to propose an over complex model, uh, do a run on as big a computer as you can get, and then not really know what we've learned. Uh, I guess that's true of all things, not just my. Well, when, you, when you try to invert a model, as this is an idea, you try to infer parameters from the data. There are relatively straightforward, well-known technical things that go wrong if you build a model that's got more parameters than the data have information for. So, I mean, that's why I would. Um, yeah, I mean, how do you do your statistics? There are all the statistical ways of deciding whether a model is to break. Yeah. So, given the amount of data you've got, you can very easily build a model that's that you can't learn about from which the data don't give you enough information. Um, and this is a well-known problem. I mean, most people studying MSc or PhD level statistics will know about this problem. But it is a 
a TV talk to geography and studying statistics. I know that because I teach geography and statistics, and we don't can I? So it is possible for those people without appropriate training to take a, mod a, a modeling framework that somebody else has developed and bolt on another bit and very easily get to the stage where they haven't got enough information in the data. But if you talk, talk with, with statisticians, they, they shouldn't make that mistake. So there are technical answers to this question, and there are also questions. <coughs> That's right. I, I've 
always worked as a decorator throughout my career. And building the new team at the beginning is really hard work. And I quite understand why some people just say, you know, they try it for a little while, you know, they spend two or three months trying to understand and they give up and they give away and they just I understand. But if you make the effort and you go through that process, you build collaborative teams, and I now have, I'm now a member of five or six fairly big collaborative teams, they are really rewarding. And I think everybody, in one sense or another, knows that because most people involved in computer applications and archaeology is either already in such a group or is a close friend to somebody. You know, we all can see that there are some very successful collaborations going on. I think you're right. We can't all do everything. You have to work with people we trust. And the other thing to do is to go to conferences like this so that you've heard some of the category and you know that there is something you probably need to ask about. There's lots I can do, lots of what Vincent does, but don't understand. I know where Vincent is, I just want to say, I can't even, can I, can you help? Collaboration is the key. So, any other contributions? That's very positive. <laughs> I think I propose we wrap it up there. There's plenty of opportunity for informal chatting now if you'd like anybody would like to stay. And uh, otherwise I think we should go and get a drink. I need one. <laughs>